So we are um, two of the co-founders of Normation, a company that's based in Paris that created Rudder. Uh, we work on Rudder. Um, myself, I'm more from a sysadmin infrastructure management background. Um, I, I used to be a sysadmin, I guess, because now I mostly run a company and build a product. Um, and I have contributed to various open source projects over the years. Um, in particular, I was an open LDAP uh, contributor, and I've contributed somewhat to CF Engine. As these guys should probably nod their heads. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, and now I work pretty much exclusively on Rudder and NCF. And I am Niklas Charles. I'm as well a uh, co founder of Normation, uh, co developer of Rudder NCF. I'm a developer by trade. Uh, right now, I'm more, yeah, as well running a company. I've been contributed quite a few to CF Engine as well, other open source project. Uh, but no, we, yeah. <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, and uh, now, yeah, I'm mainly working on Rudder and running the mission. Before continuing, I have a question. How many of you have already used Rudder before? Okay. Cool. Um, so the point of this talk was that we wanted to introduce some of <coughs> what has changed in Rudder since we talked about it last year at Config Management Camp, previous years at Foster, and to kind of get everyone <coughs> up to date. Partly because we're kind of proud of the new version we're going to release, so we wanted to talk about that as well. Um, but we thought we'd start with a bit of an overview of what is Rudder, what how we define Rudder. Um, this is maybe a little bit of a different crowd than we usually talk to because we're mixed between people who are, know CF Engine really well and people who know Rudder really well. Um, so I'm going to try and well, we're going to try and cater for both of those points of view. Um, we're going to introduce uh, a lot of the new features in 3.0, which should hopefully show people who don't know Rudder how it works, at least partly, and discuss ideas we have for uh, the following versions. Uh, and I'm hoping maybe that can be a bit of a, either some food for thought uh, as to what we, as people who work in config management, can do in the future, or what we can build together, um, maybe what CF Engine and Rudder can do together can change where, where changes can come in. Anyway, we'll see if interactiveness happens. So, quick um, start is that the point of Rudder, as we define it now, it's obviously an automation tool, um, to automate IT infrastructure um, and check compliance. The three key points that we really, really, really care about a lot are these three points. So, simplifying uh, what we do. We believe that non-experts should be able to use and benefit from configuration management and automation, not just people who are able to write infrastructure as code, uh, like in CF Engine, uh, Puppet, Chef, whatever languages there are. So we built a web interface into Rudder where you can click and point, to do many things. You can't do everything by clicking and pointing. At some point, you just have to write some infrastructure as code, um, but the point is that we separate the roles. The second point in the middle is compliance. Um, a lot of config management tools and config management approaches out there currently push things, think, yay, hope I hope this has worked, but don't really check that the configs they want to apply are there. So this is something that is important too, is that if we're pushing out configs, it's probably because they're important. For many people, production isn't just a web server that shouldn't go down. For some people, production is satellites in the sky that shouldn't fall out. Um, it's pretty big production. If we're configuring things there, we should probably be checking. Uh, so compliance. And the third part is that this should be available everywhere. And that we should be able to manage in the same way, uh, or at least the same rules on a desktop computer, on a server, on a cloud instance, Maybe on a container, um, maybe not, depending on what you took out of the talks this morning, um, on embedded devices, etc. So this third block here is basically saying, thank you CF Engine, <laughs> because it is the CF Engine code that we use as a writer agent, um, and that is what makes it possible. So, oh yeah, like I said, if you have any questions or thoughts, just interrupt me, um, shout at me, so on. Um, quick history of Rudder. Rudder we started in 2009. Uh, we developed it kind of under the hood, um, not exactly secretly, but we didn't publish it, but no one was using it, um, until 2011. And then more recently, in recent years, we set up a strict release schedule where we release a new version every three months, what we call a major version, um, that has new features, 
changes um, the way some of the things work, always backwards compatible, but changes them. Um, and we stuck to this pretty well through 2013, released pretty much every three months, and an extra one in December for some reason. And then as of the mid-2014, we decided that there was actually some bigger changes we wanted to make in Rudder. Um, we wanted to rework the reporting. The whole compliance engine is, is something that we care a lot about, and we could see that this really needed improving. So we took a kind of double uh, stretch and took about six months to build the new 3.0 version. That we talk about now. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So the aim here is basically to list uh, some of the big changes and to show what it looks like. Um, the first big change we made in 3.0 is we redesigned the web interface. The original version was designed in 2009. If you look at any web interface from 2009, it looks really, really, really old nowadays. <laughs> Ours was no exception. Um, we wanted to improve user experience, basically. This is what it used to look like, and this is what it looks like now. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is what it used to look like. <laughs> and as you can see, there was a load of wasted space in this interface. All of this red space here was on your screen, but not actually doing it. The useful content is just here in the middle. Um, this is what it now looks like. I actually have a screenshot. And as you can see, that is basically almost 100% useful content. We kind of went crazy and have like 15 pixels on each side that is not useful, but we were assuming that that would be okay. Um, so the big changes you can see in the interface here, are that there's a new menu at the top. It's like a, a standard bootstrap menu. Many people recognize, feel comfortable with. Uh, it should look a bit more up to date than the previous version. You, you can judge on that, not me. Um, and yeah, we're basically trying to bring this into the 21st century. Um, the other thing that we have uh, changed is that previously there were two different menus. Rudder has about nine different screens, and two different menus to access nine screens was really not the most efficient thing. So where we had a configuration policy menu up here, um, there were three subsections, rules, directives, and parameters. So for those of you who don't know Rudder, a directive is an abstract set of configuration. So for example, this is what I want my SSH server settings to be. No root access, uh, don't listen on port 22 because I want to hide it on port 1234. Um, only log um, in info, something like that. That's not applied to anything. And then we use rules, which is the step above, to actually apply that to some nodes, some hosts. And, and we replace that with uh, one, just a one, menu, one bootstrap menu. You put your mouse over it, you hover, you can click, and you can see what it's. Uh, what well, you can immediately access all of the pictures. And it's even much better than what, for those who don't know, that you can imagine, because to go to the directive, you needed to click on configuration policy, and it loaded the whole page, and then you needed to click to the directive to access the directive page. Yeah. And speaking of directives, this is what our directives page looked like before. Someone had the bright idea someday to say, let's put all the information in tabs because for a brief period in 2011, tabs were cool in web interfaces. Uh, they're not anymore, because the world changed. Uh, <laughs> who knows? So we replaced that uh, with a much bigger view, where basically you can just scroll through all of the information. Um, what you're seeing here is a directive to install packages. Um, so this is basically just giving a package name to install, and specifying whether you, just some options. Do you want to allow untrusted packages? Do you want to install the package or update it or remove it? Um, this is a directive in Rudder, and it's basically been made the most simple possible so that anyone can do that without writing uh, CMN code. There's a save button that's always available. You can go through, you can click, save time. Uh, you don't have to scroll down. Um, and mm. we immediately display at the bottom of each directive what rules it is part of and what compliance level they are at currently. So if you're editing, for example, your SSH config, you can know straight away in this page if there are any services that have errors applying that config, uh, for example. Speaking of reporting, uh, that's something else we changed. Yeah, now we are very much easier to understand reporting status or system. Before we used to display the worst status, we were quite pessimistic, so if something was wrong, we showed that everything was wrong, it was like, wow, it's broken. Now we have this status bar with all the different states. So, yeah, thank you. 
you have the different states with percent of each state. The percent is proportional to the number of nodes that are these states and the number of components. So the more, the, the better your system is, the longer the green, green bar is. You can drill down this reporting so you can see by nodes or by component what is right and what is wrong. Just to clarify, the component is a part of a configuration. So in my SSH example, <coughs> we probably have four components. One would be install the SSH package, one would be edit the SSH config file, one would be make sure that you restart SSH if you edit the file, and one would be ensure that SSH is running. Each of those is a component in Rudder speak. And as a bonus, we have also the list of all the changes that has been done in the past three days as a graph. So here we have a lot of columns. Uh, it's better to explain what they are. The first one, the light green, yeah, light green, is not applicable. Something that is not applicable it means we don't, we didn't need to do that on the system, right? Installing SSH on the Windows Server usually, you just don't need to do that or check permission of a slash etc file on Windows. It's not applicable. Success means, as in CFNG that the, state, the status was correct. The agent didn't have to do anything, it was per correct, so it's okay. Applying means that we have new rules to apply on this system, but the system didn't come and fetch the new rules yet. So we don't know the state, we, are, we know it is applying. At some point, the node will connect, fetch the new, uh, the new rules, and apply them, and send back reports. If it doesn't send back reports, then we have the blue, no response. No response means the node is probably down, and uh, you should go and have a look of, because why, uh, to see why it is down. Yeah, it could be down, or it could be simply not connected to the network. We have yeah. some users that have but have installed on um, <coughs> video displays in the middle of cities or motorways, and because they use GSM connections, sometimes they just don't have a connection. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem, it just means I don't know what's happening at the moment. It could be that the machine is down, or it could just be that it's offline. Then, unexpected is a bug. Uh, if you come across unexpected, you should yell at the people who made the technique, because it's wrong. And finally, error means that the agent couldn't repair something. It was not in the correct state, it could not reach it. Like installing a package, if the package is not there, it's probably an error. So this is all um, deliberately pessimistic. If there's ever any doubt about what status a node or component is in, we'll always assume the worst state. Um, if we don't know that a host is okay, we'll assume it's not responding. If we don't understand the reports we've received, we will display it in this unexpected, or even in the error. But the point is that we never want to have any false positives. The last thing we want is to tell people, yeah, your servers are fine, and then actually find out, no, there was, there was a security hole somewhere. There was something that you thought was checked that wasn't. So this is an overall reporting, but as I said before, we can drill down. So here it's a list of all the rules applied on systems. So on the left, we have the name, administrator account configuration to manage administrator account, etc., the website. For each of them, you have a compliance, so a bar with several colors. And then the recent change. Recent change is something has been done on the system to repair them. If we drill down on that, we get two kinds of reports. The first one is per directive. So I install my package, my, sorry. I manage my administrator's account. So I create an admin account, I push the SSH keys, uh, I make sure that they have uh, sudo rights, and it's 75% okay. On all of them, so only 75%, something is wrong. Then I can see by node that it's actually the node 3 that is not reporting. There's no report. All the other three nodes are okay, so I will have to investigate why the node 3 is not reporting. This is a useful separation because sometimes it's going to be a node problem and sometimes it's going to be a config problem. So you can see with these two tables very quickly which, which to look at. And finally, you have the list of everything that has been modified on this system. So here is a recent change, on, uh, again, for this administrative account. So several hours before the screenshot was done, it's been modified. So 
on most of the nodes, and below I have the list of every modification that has been done. I can click on each of the bar to see what happened at each of these moments. It's by a six hour long uh, time scale, and it's over three days. Cool. <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to be talking now. Uh, so we've, one of the other main features we've added in Rudder 3.0 is that all of this information was previously available on a directive, on a node, and on a rule basis, but there was no overview, uh, no overall summary. And this is what we've added. This is now the home page, I mean the main page of Rudder when you log in. Um, and it's a dashboard that shows basically how is the IT, how are the IT systems that you're managing with Rudder. We have a Overall compliance, which is basically something that you want to be at 100% all the time, if possible. Um, a breakdown, so you can see why it's not at 100%. This is what we elaborated on earlier. And a breakdown of how healthy your nodes are. So this is um, actually a separation of nodes that are, all the green ones are 100%. All of these nodes have no problems. These nodes have some problems, but not too much. A few, a lot of problems, and a huge amount of problems. Basically, as you um, deploy Rudder on an existing infrastructure, you're usually going to come across loads of machines that have slightly different configurations. So this is not going to be green the first time you set something up, but you're going to work through um, different rules, different um, changes to get it more and more green. And one approach that can be nice is to extend the green all the way around, so you get more hosts that are perfect, or to reduce the red so that you get more and more hosts that are not terrible, uh, basically. Um, and then finally we have some statistics over here about the actual machines, the underlying machines, uh, because Rudder Agent, what we call Rudder Agent, is actually a mixture of two agents. One is CF Engine and one is a tool called Fusion Inventory, which takes an inventory of the hardware, network and software uh, level of each machine, whatever it is, um, and that tells us some basic stuff. What we've displayed here is the machine types, physical or virtual, um, the operating systems, Debian, Red Hat, Fedora in these examples, and finally, the version of the Rudder agent, because when you're managing a Rudder server, that's pretty useful information. If you have forgotten that you have a really old Rudder agent version somewhere, it may not be doing what you hope it is doing. In future versions, we hope to make this dashboard more configurable. Currently, this is what it displays. Um, it would be really nice that in the future we could, instead of displaying the OS, for example, we could display OS versions. If like your whole, all of your systems are Red Hat, this is going to be a really boring graph. But it could be nice to see what's Red Hat 5, 6, 7, and so on. Um, similarly, we could probably add some widgets in to detail uh, compliance for one rule. If you have one rule that's like the security policy that you really care about, it could be good to see that over as well. So, I said we're going to kind of switch between the overview, uh, voter point of view, and the CF engine point of view. Um, this is more of a technical view. Um, we, we've got two different compliance modes within Rudder. Um, they're called full compliance or changes only. The way this works is that every CF engine agent on a machine will check every uh, target status, you know, speaking from its theory terms, the desired state of each <coughs> component. And for each component, it will decide that it's either success, it's okay, it was fine, if we repaired it and we made a change, or if there was an error, either while checking or while repairing. Um, previously, Rudder would send one level of one line of syslog to the Rudder server to tell which state each component was in. And a lot of the job of the web interface to generate um, these pretty graphs was to compile and analyze all of this reporting data. Um, and what we realized was that most of the time, on a stable infrastructure, everything you're checking is fine. I mean, we realized that quite a few years ago, but we realized that a lot of the bandwidth we were using up for that was just saying, oh, component A is success, <coughs> component A is success, component A is success, every five minutes. By default, the agent runs every five minutes. Um, and occasionally, we get a repaired message. So some of our customers using the GSM links I just talked about uh, for bus stops, where they pay by megabyte of data transfer, decided that we were wasting a lot of their money um, and that we could probably do better. Uh, oh, better. <laughs> <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> um, so we implemented a different um, 
So these are all, each, each, each piece of information here is a CF Engine report that actually gets sent to a local syslog server that then gets sent on to a distant syslog server to be centralized. So we've um, added a new mode in um, that instead of reporting all of the successes, just reports the repaired or error messages. So only if there's a change, plus the name changes only. Um, and because most of the time servers would just not say anything to us, we've added in a heartbeat. So on a regular basis, uh, we just get a heartbeat saying, I'm alive. This enables us to differentiate between a node that's disconnected and a node where everything is fine. Um, we've extended that a little bit further so that the heartbeat can actually not, can be less frequent than the runtime. If we run every five minutes, we could have just a heartbeat every hour. And if we haven't heard from a node within an hour, we assume that the config is okay. But then if we haven't heard from it for more than an hour, we assume it's dead. So this is a huge bandwidth saving uh, and database storage saving uh, on the server as well. You fix several order of magnitude less information on the network. We have some users that will pass from 600 messages every five minutes to one every one hour, which is much better. <laughs> yeah. Much, much better. Yeah. Well, I have a question. How does, uh, how do you, is it, the heartbeat I suppose goes one direction. I let you know I'm alive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do then does the node know that there is new policy to download, if there is? It's still running every five minutes, exactly as it would uh, okay. in a standard CF engine installation. Okay. Just so that the reports don't go yeah. every five minutes. Yeah. Just the agent wakes up and it contacts the server and says, do you have a new policy for me? The server says no. End of story. It applies the old policy. Yeah, makes sense. <coughs> For your information, we use the um, promises generated mechanism, where there's a file that gets touched every time there are new promises. We just copy that on the network to save, again, to save on bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so another new feature from Rudder 3.0 is the technique editor. A technique <coughs> in Rudder is the equivalent of a module in Puppet or a cookbook in Chef. Uh, or I think a playbook in Ansible. I'm not very good on the Ansible vocabulary. Um, which basically contains the how do I do something for all types of operating systems supported. So we have, for example, techniques to install packages, techniques to set up the Apache HTTP server, um, techniques <coughs> to add users to a system, techniques to copy SSH keys, uh, this kind of thing. And previously, techniques were written uh, in CF Engine code, interspersed with some uh, templating language so that Rudder could inject variables in there. It was pretty hard to write a new technique, if I'm honest. You had to know CF Engine really well, and you had to know Rudder's additions to it, and basically, no one apart from the five of us and a couple of other guys <laughs> in this room could do it. So, obviously, we didn't get many technique contributions. We did get some, and um, the people who did that are awesome. <laughs> and it's great to see. Um, but what we've now done is we've introduced a level of indirection. Um, mm -hmm another level in that direction, which is called NCF, which I presented here last year. I think people who are in the CF Engine community have probably heard of NCF before. Um, and what we've done now is that we've added a graphical interface on top of NCF so that you can grab um, a module, for example, the command execution module, and just configure it using the web interface. Again, just entering really simple uh, commands in the web interface, complex commands, why not? Um, and to limit this using basic CF engine conditions, like what operating system do I want to use it on? I could use it on Debian. This is the equivalent of in CF engine writing Debian colon colon, but it's accessible in a web interface. And what this does is two things. It will generate CF engine code, or actually print out CF engine code on a .cf file on your disk somewhere, and it will make a new technique for Rudder so that you can, so the users of Rudder uh, can then use that to apply it as a abstract template to yet more services. So I don't know if that's extremely clear. Um, fortunately, the talk after next is going to introduce this whole technique editor in detail. So, it's, uh, it's one question. Can you then export those and share them? Uh, those techniques created that, that, that way, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, each technique ends up in a directory, which has a, a structure inside. So there's a .cf file, there's a .xml file for the rudder technique bit, and then you can just copy and paste that. Oh, you know, share it, get pull, request it, whatever. <laughs> and actually, the, <coughs> actually the web NCF Builder web interface is 
can be run standalone too if you want. All right. So you could also run it without Rudder if you wanted to. Yeah. In which case it doesn't generate Rudder techniques, it just generates CF engine code. Um, speaking of NCF, there have been some improvements since yeah. last year. I think this time last year we had finished writing NCF about one week ago. Uh, <laughs> so we had all of ooh, 10, 15 generic methods. We're now up to 66 generic methods, 67 I hear. Uh, 67 at the end of the day, <laughs> <laughs> after the tutorial. Um, and there's all sorts of things in there. Um, the point of an NCF generic method is that it is objective and not subjective. So one method can do one and one thing only in the sense that installing a package is not something you can really debate about how you do it. Um, configuring Apache is something you can debate about how you do it. So we do not have an Apache generic method. Um, we need Debian and Red Hat have different ways of putting the files in. But we have a bunch of things like well, running commands, creating directories, editing files, copying files, um, duplicating files, creating symlinks for files, showing services are running. <coughs> All the service methods in NCF now support both uh, init D, or well, sysv init, um, and systemd, and we also still have some support for upstart in there, which is what Ubuntu used for a few years. Um, there's all sorts of things. There's even some generic methods in there that can go and call out to REST APIs. Uh, it's basically just wrappers around HTTP tools curl. like curl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the spirit of, of Mitchell's keynote this morning, where everything is becoming APIs, yeah, I, I could not agree more. This is more and more times we think, oh yeah, if I could just curl out to this, this REST API, I could, I could set things up. And that can be embedded in an NCF method. We have some. Um, anything to add on that? No, you said everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, a few more features that we've added in Rudder 3.0. This one is, is pretty powerful. It's very simple. Um, because we have an inventory of all nodes, we know a lot of things about the nodes. What we can't tell is what is not technical. We can't tell if this node here is owned by customer X. Uh, we can't tell if this node is sitting in a data center in uh, Munich, or a data center in Paris, or a data center in London. We have no idea. Um, we can tell what IP address it has. Maybe there's a rule. Um, we can't tell when the uh, guarantee uh, is up for that. But a lot of companies have something like a CMDB, Configuration Management Database, or an asset, inventory asset database, that contains all this information. So what we've enabled is to set very simple key called value pairs on nodes in Rudder via the REST API, so that you can classify your nodes based on external data. This means that you can create groups um, within the Rudder interface based on properties. For example, here we have our env type production, and then we can go and search for all nodes that have uh, name equals value properties that come up with a um, env type this production group. So using that, you can then target your configuration rules based on business um, criteria, like what customers using this, maybe what SLA they have, maybe what the downtime hours for them are. Um, depending on different businesses, obviously downtime is not the same. For an office uh, production thing, you want everything to be up between nine and five every day in the week. If you're working in the banking area, pretty much everything actually happens in the night, so you can break things from nine to five. It's the exact opposite. Um, and all these things obviously depend on how we, as system administrators, manage our systems. We added also a command line interface. So now we have the Rudder something that lets you execute commands with Rudder. So you have the Rudder agent to execute command for Rudder, uh, to load, force an inventory, to force a run, uh, to disable the run, any run, future run of the agent, re it, reset it, uh, version to know which version of the agent you are running, which is quite useful for debugging as well. Uh, so it makes it much easier to run, in the, to use in the command line. So you don't have to remember the full path to the command and all the parameters. It's a welcome improvement for every user. We have also uh, the same for the server part. So we have on the server side. And we have a Rudder server debug. This Rudder server debug will allow to debug a client server communication with a specific node. It will run a specific server on a different port and reroute all the communication from the specific nodes we want to debug to this server. So it's not uh, 
interwined with every other uh, node that you may have. If you have 1,000 nodes, it would be too hard to debug because if you just scroll down, and you won't see what's happening. With this, you have only the reports from the specific node, and you can see what's happening. So this is kind of a weird feature um, in that it's literally, I don't know, maybe 10 lines of code. <laughs> it's tiny. But the effect it has on debugging, debugging uh, if the nodes that are not working or just using Reddit every day is huge. Um, I tried to use a pre-3.0 Reddit installation. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I didn't remember any of the paths. I couldn't do any of the commands. So it's, yeah, it's pretty nice. I think I did that once. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you mean. <laughs> yeah. um, last but not least, uh, we have added a tool that's going to help us as developers to run it 3.0. Um, basically, it's a very simple script that will gather some data about the, each Rudder installation and we'll send it back to the rudderproject.org um, site. Um, obviously, this is anonymous data. Obviously, it is opt-in only. If you don't click yes, it will never get sent. Um, but it is something that's going to help us understand a lot better what people are doing with Rudder, which features they're using, what's the average size of, of nodes, number of nodes they're using, um, so that we can kind of fine-tune uh, the web uh, interface to use that better. This is an example uh, just to show what is reported. It is, it is really basic stuff for now, just like the OS name you're running, which features are enabled, um, how many reports you have per day, just basic metrics on usage. Um, as you can tell, there's nothing nominative in there at all. Um, so we've put a lot of effort into respecting privacy uh, and, then, and if anyone is using Rudder um, and you upgrade to 3.0, we would really appreciate it if you hit yes <laughs> on the send statistics. I can understand if you don't want to, but if you do have the option, that would be helpful. And we guarantee, obviously, that these are not going to be shared, uh, no logs are going to be published, nothing like that. Uh, how is that submitted? Is that HTTP? Sorry? Is that submitted by the straight HTTP? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's an HTTP post. Okay, so um, a couple of other things that got changed in Rudder 3.0. I didn't bother doing a slide for each. Uh, one thing is pretty important. There's a huge performance boost. Uh, we changed a lot of the indexes and the caching we used, both in the databases and in the web app itself. Um, one example is that one page with 2,000 nodes that used to take two seconds to load now takes 80 milliseconds instead. It's a pretty big performance boost. <laughs> Um, and we've tested it with up to 5,000 nodes, and it just behaves fast. Yeah. Um, what else? We have a new package that helps install uh, relay servers. So relay servers are a, basically a proxy for Rudder data, so that the reports get sent. If you have a DMZ, for example, you can put a relay in the DMZ to avoid opening loads of network uh, ports from the DMZ. We have system D support, I mentioned that. We've added support for the most recent OSs, Red Hat 7, CentOS 7, Debian 8, which is not yet released, but should be soon. Soon in the Debian timeframe, anyway. <laughs> um, and we can now just have a different run frequency by node. We used to be able to set the run frequency globally, so five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, up to six hours. Uh, now it can be different on different nodes. Uh, this may make sense if you have some machines that uh, are more overloaded, or do you want to make changes on less frequently, or the bandwidth costs more, for example, um, and you can reduce that. So, I think we have covered pretty much what we want to say about Rudder 3.0. Um, this is a big version for us because it is basically the accomplishment of many of the ideas that we've known were not correct in Rudder, or that we've known we could do better for years, and now they're there. Um, and this is software that's now being used by quite a few large corporations. Um, lots of them, because they're large corporations and they do sensitive things, I cannot name. Um, but there's some pretty big customers out there that are running Butter. Um, I think it's safe to say at this stage that Butter is pretty reliable because these companies keep using it. Um, they're pretty happy with it. Um, we get up to, well, we get over 2,000 downloads of the Butter server per month. Um, obviously, some of these are existing users that are upgrading, but there's definitely quite a lot of interest out there. And we really think that Butter 3.0 could be um, a great step forward for that. Um, still, we're thinking about the future. Um, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to do this pretty quickly. But 
The next version of Rudder will be 3.1. It's basically going to have a huge focus on the API, adding in any missing data in the API, um, improving the uh, access control in the API. All the things in the API that were broken or not ideal, we're going to fix in 3.1, which will be released next month. And then looking beyond that, uh, ideas we have um, to improve Rudder is basically Breaking away from the hierarchical model, a lot of people look at IT and companies in a hierarchical model. That doesn't really work very well um, for many things, many complex systems, because usually um, there's so many different ways of analyzing systems. Do you look at all the Debian systems, or do you group things by data center, or you group them by production? There's so many different ways of grouping hosts uh, nowadays that it doesn't make sense to have a hierarchy. So we're going to introduce tags on anything we can. <coughs> like OS type equals Debian or um, production environment equals uh, production. No, yeah, environment equals production. <laughs> and as you see, that's kind of what we started doing with nodes in, in 3.0. That will be the basis to provide much improved authorizations. So we'll be able to distribute write access, read access, depending on those tags. For example, you have the production environment tag, you can access production environment. Um, machines. You don't, you don't, so on. Uh, we're going to introduce, well, extend the check-only mode that we have, uh, which means that not only we can set configs, but we also just use Rudder to check configs and still see the graphs, but not actually fix things. This means we won't break things if, um, you know, for some weird reason, some software was relying on the wrong config. That's a theory. I've heard it happens. Um, never seen that, of course. Uh, better forms for directives. Um, adding extension points and a whole load of plugins to tie in with other tools. We are running out of time. We are running out of time. Uh, the main idea also is to be able to integrate with more external tools, uh, CMDB, monitoring, to, to have a full stack of everything. So you could have an issue created by the monitoring that will do something in the CMDB that will trigger something in Rudder that will automatically repair the issue. The monitoring will check that it's correct and it will close the tickets automa automatically. That would be the m big idea for all these third party plugins, extension points, and uh, API stuff. So, are there any questions or comments? Or Ideas that you wanted to share. The connection to a CMDB. We have our own CMDB. We have also an AP. It's a JSON format. Can you hook that up into the router if there are extension points? Yeah, that's that's the aim. Currently, it's just a standard REST API. So if you write a 10, 20 line Python script that can read in whatever source format you have, convert it, and push it to the the Rudder REST API you have integration. We've done this on a test basis with a few tools. It's pretty much always a specific script because different companies have different data they want to store, different CMDBs, but it's it's an hour or two of work. So. Can you say a few words about uh, the <coughs> access control? And, uh, like you can point to external sources and uh, use groups and things in that regard and all that to map? That is actually something else we're working on. <laughs> um, currently, all the access, all the users, well, we can authenticate users from an LDAP directory. We can automatically provision them, but all of the access control in Rudder is in a separate file on the Rudder server. So it's all Rudder centric. But the point is to be able to use groups from Active Directory, for example, um, to sync those groups with, with the Rudder server as well. How far ahead is the ideas are there. Um, small disclaimer, I used to work in the identity management field, so my job was for four, four years synchronizing uh, <laughs> LDAP databases. So I'm pretty confident about what we need to do. Um, it's just a question of priority. Um, for now, most users get around that because, while well, you may have thousands or tens of thousands of users in your Active Directory or LDAP. Usually you wouldn't have all of them that you actually want to log into the web server. So people are usually quite happy just synchronizing if you've got 10 or 20 sysadmins logging into Rudder, that's already a lot for the average installation. So users are usually quite happy to do that manually. Yeah. 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 Yeah.